Today's scripture is from Luke 14, 25-35. Now great crowd, crowds accompanied him and turned and said to him, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he can't be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to compete, complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid down, laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it being, to, it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down and first deliberate, deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet great way off, he sends a delegation and sends for terms of peace. So therefore, anyone who goes, any one of you who does not renounce all that has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is not of no use either for the soil or for manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. I got to be honest. I'm having a hard time standing here right now because I'm emotional. I, the, the drama and the testimonies have gotten to me this morning. Um, <laughs> so I apologize for that. But... Um, I introduced myself earlier, and I know you know some of you aren't here. My name is Cash. I'm the high school pastor here. Um, I work alongside of John Farney, and we get to just love on these kids, and um, it's such a great thing that we get to do. Um, let me can let me start off praying because I feel like that might calm me down a little bit. <laughs> so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, thanks for this morning. Um, I just pray that you will um, give me strength as I try to press forward and and deliver the word that you have um, for me to share. And I just thank you for these students who've been here this weekend, for all you've been up to, for all you're doing, for all the folks that have been involved this morning in the service, and for all the folks who are here to see and witness these students in action and to to support them and love them. So um, just bless our time. I pray in your name. Amen. Um, like I said, we had the Walk with Christ going on this weekend, and a lot of these kids were able to grow and learn. And the, and the best thing about the Walk with Christ, the best thing about it, is they don't have to listen to me talk to them. <laughs> it's all student-led. All of the talks are done by kids and by a handful of adult volunteers, some parents and stuff that they have selected, that they want to hear from. And they put it together. They run it. I kind of stand and supervise and make sure, you know, the building doesn't burn down. Um, But they are the ones who put it on and they are the ones who put into it and get out of it. And so I'm I'm extremely proud of them and I'm so happy that you guys could be here to see kind of the culmination of that process. Um, This morning I want to talk about, like last year, we've set up this youth service to be the culmination of this weekend so that we can celebrate our students all at the same time. And I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we do as a youth ministry. What John and I do as we sit down and plan, what our, our board does as we sit down and plan and look to, and vision cast, and what our student leaders help us do as we minister to students both here and outside these walls. And so to more, this morning I want to talk about this whole idea of being bold. And, and, I, and I think that that's our direction in student ministry is to be bold, to do things that we feel like God is calling us to, and sometimes that's not easy. I'll give you a great example. Um, several years ago, I was taking a, a plane flight across country, and I'm, I'm always an early person. I'm always on time, and so like I'm sure some of you are, you get on the plane, you're waiting. There's always that one person, right, who's running way behind. And so, you know, the stewardess says, hey, we're waiting on this person, they're coming in, and this person comes in, they got their little carry-on luggage, and they're going to check all the compartments, even though all of them are full, they're going to check all of them. And right about that time, 
he gets a phone call. Right? Do you think he says, ah, I'm on the plane. I'm a... No. Of course he takes it. Who calls you on the phone? People with nothing to do. <laughs> My girlfriend will tell you, I can't stand to talk on the phone. I don't like it. But, you know, and you could tell that's what this, you know, he's a guy on the phone. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm trying, trying to get on a plane right now. And, you know, we're all sitting there going, all right, come on, you, you already made us late. You're looking for luggage. You're talking on the phone. What are you going to do? So this guy in the plane gets up and says, um, can I help you? And he goes, yeah, 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 that'd be great, great, great. He takes his phone. <laughs> Everybody on the plane's like, because <laughs> we all were thinking, you know what I'd like to do? Turn that guy's phone off right now. But one guy on the plane had the boldness to do that. And here's the thing. Being bold is not easy. You know why? It's not easy for me. I like people to like me. I don't like people to not, to not like me. I don't like people to be upset with me. And so us being bold as a student ministry and me being bold here this morning, um, it's not easy. It's not easy when I think about, hey, what am I going to share with the kids this week? It's not easy when God gives me a word that I go, they're not going to like that. And they might not come back. If I tell them that, they might not come back. That doesn't make me feel good. I want them here. I want this big section full. I want them up in the, up in the youth hall. I want them in that room. And sometimes I feel like God gives me things and I go, really? Can you think about it? Second opinion? And so this is the question I wrestled with a few years ago that God gave me. He said, when you're alone with this book, when you're alone with the Bible, are you at peace? When you read this thing, are you at peace with where you are spiritually? And are you at peace with where your youth group is spiritually? That's what I put you in charge of. Are you at peace with that? And, and I'm, I'm going to say youth group over and over. But when I say youth group, I, you know, I think this is a question we could ask of this church, of any church, of the church, the big C church. It's a question we could ask of ourselves. When you are alone with God's word and you are reading it, are you at peace with where you're at? And I sat down and I started reading the book of Acts. And we're, and we're talking about, John and I are, are talking about potentially pursuing the book of Acts next year with our students. And, I, and it scares me to death. You know why? Because I look at the book of Acts and I look at what we do as a youth group and I go, I don't even know where to start. It would, it would be like going into an ice skating rink, seeing 20 kids, two teams of 10, sitting around, throwing fish at hamsters and going, uh, what are y'all doing? They go, we're playing soccer. I don't even know where to start. Like, how do you, how do you um, yeah, we're, we're way, we're on two different planes here. And that's how I feel sometimes when I read Acts and I look at what we do, I go, Man, I just, I don't know that we're there. But I come, and we have kids in the room, and then I go and talk to other youth pastors, and I go to conferences, and I go, everybody seems okay with this model, so I guess it's fine, because we don't, you know, we don't drink too much, and we don't smoke too much, and we don't cuss too much, and we come to church a couple times a week, and hey, we're in good shape, Right? And I, and I sit down and I look at the book of Acts and I think, you know, in chapter 1, they're, they're sitting in this upper room and they're waiting for the Spirit to come. And, and then in chapter 2, the Spirit comes and they, they start speaking these different languages and people are coming to know Christ and they're doing these miracles and all the, all the Christians are gathering together and selling everything they own and saying, hey, look, let's put all our money together. We're going to take care of each other. And then, and then this, this sin starts to rise up and God squashes it. He says, not in, my, not in my church. And then you got Stephen, right? This guy named Stephen in Acts. And he's standing out preaching and preaching Jesus and saying, I see him. I see Jesus. 
And they're, they're throwing these rocks at him, trying to kill him. He goes, I don't care. Keep throwing them. I'm not going to stop preaching. And it's just like Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell won't stop us. And then I think about what we do and I go, it's pretty stoppable. I mean, John and I leave. What happens to the group? The music starts being awful. What happens to the group? We change nights. What happens to the group? And I could say the same about any, any group, any group in the church, any church. It's like, I felt this heart for not turning all of these folks into a bunch of shoppers. Well, I'm going to go over here because I like the music better. Well, I like this guy better, so I'm going to go over here. Well, that guy was kind of annoying me, so I don't really want to go there anymore. And I think that's what, we're, I think that's what we as a society are, are promoting, and I, I want to fight against that. And <laughs> I, I start asking the question, are these students coming, are you coming here because you're passionately in love with Christ. Are you a passionate follower of Jesus Christ? Followers of Jesus. Do you get, do you, do you get the, the importance and the emphasis there? The followers of Jesus wouldn't let the gates of hell stop them. Here's, here's the toughest question I've ever had to ask myself. If Jesus had a youth group... In Greenville, would any of these kids want to go? If he had a youth group in Greenville, I think ours would be bigger. Because Jesus' words were really harsh. And he could never hold a crowd like I can. He can't. He can't. And I'll, I, you know, because when Jesus taught, all he did was make people angry, and they left. Great example. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 4. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And some fell into the good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And he said these, as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Great crowds are following. Great crowds come to hear this guy Jesus preach. They've heard he does these miracles. they heard he has these great words. And as they gather, he says, Thank you all for coming. Bring a friend next week. No, he doesn't. <laughs> he says, he tells this weird story. He goes, there's this farmer and he's throwing seed around. Some lands on the path and it gets trampled. Some lands on the rock and it grows up and dies. Some, some lands in the thorns and it gets choked out. And some lands on the good soil and it produces fruit. If you get it, you get it. And he walks off. And so in verse, in verse 9, his disciples come up to him and go, what was that? They said, and when his disciples asked him what the peril meant, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for the others they are in parables, listen to this, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Did you hear that? He said, I speak in parables so that, you see all those people out there? When I teach... I don't want them to really understand what I'm saying. And that totally goes against everything I've ever heard. I always thought, you know, oh, the parables, they're a great teaching tool. Jesus used them so everybody can get it. Well, he says here, no, no. He said, all those people, he says why, right in the parable. All those people, those are the rocks and the path and the thorns. He said, what am I going to do? If I'm a farmer, am I going to throw seed? I'm going to go out and like, some of the seeds on the rock, what am I going to go keep watering rocks? That would be dumb. So what's going to happen? They're going to grow up, and as soon as the first sign of conflict comes, they're going to go away. 
And he goes, you know, if I throw seed over here in this thorny soil where these things come up and choke these people out, am I going to come over here and spend my life fertilizing this soil? He said, disciples, you guys, you're the good, si- good soil. You're the ones that get it. Because you come up to me and you go, hey, what was that, what was that story? He said, you're the ones I want to invest my time in. You're the ones I want to invest my life in. And that doesn't have anything to do with Jesus not loving these people. He just said, I want to make sure where they're at. I want to make sure that they're the good soil. And I'll just be honest. I spend a lot of time and a lot of energy watering rocks. Trying to make people happy. Because I, I'm scared to do that. I'm scared to, to preach like Jesus. I'm scared to be bold. Because I don't want to walk up one Sunday morning to Sunday school and have nobody there. A couple chapters later, in Luke 14, which was our, our scripture for the morning, the crowds have come back. Verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied again. And he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever, to, whoever does not bear up his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Nice introduction. Way to go. The crowds came back. What did you do? Hey, you want, you want to be my disciple? You don't, you, your father? Your mother? You hate them? Do you not want, you, are you prepared... To come follow me. Because, you know, I think if Jesus came here, guest preacher, for March, March Missions Day, Jesus is going to come in and preach. And he stands up here. I think he goes, all right, y'all came y'all came because of me. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to walk out that door. And if you want to follow me, come on. Don't stop and say goodbye. Don't shake it. Don't look and see who's coming with me. It's like Jerry, the Jerry Maguire movie, right? When he, when he quits. Who's coming with me? So what Jesus is asking. Who's coming with me? He said, I'm walking out the door, and you don't know what's outside of that door. We may be walking out that door, and right outside that door, there may be a row full of crosses, and we're all going to take them and hike up to the top of Paris Mountain and, and all get crucified. Who's coming with me? That's the question he's asking. And he goes on. He says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. There's a lot of construction going on downtown. They're building that Bergamo Plaza up. They're making it, you know, this great thing. Don't you think those folks, when they sat down to start building that building, said, all right, do we have enough money? Do we have enough workers? You know, do we have enough time to do it by the deadline we got to do it? Are we going to be able to get this thing done? Do we have the plans laid? Do we have the the stuff at hand. Of course they did. Because they don't want to get it stuck up there and everybody go, what's the deal? What's the deal? He built this building and now there's nothing here. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you up front, this is the cost. I want you to know ahead of time what it's going to cost you to be my disciple. Because I don't want you to get halfway into this thing and quitting on me. I don't want you to get halfway in and going, well, I didn't know that meant I couldn't date her, and I didn't know that meant I had to stay married to him, and I didn't know that meant my daughter and I, we weren't going to get along. Yeah, I'm telling you up front, this is the cost of being my disciple. Is it always going to be that? Maybe not, but you've got to be prepared for it. Because this is the potential cost. It might, it might cost you to be my follower, to be my disciple. He goes on. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends out a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce that, or renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. He says, it's like going to war. Do you believe we're in a war? Is it a war when you're following Christ? Okay, I have to do this with the kids sometimes. Is it a war when you're following Christ? This means yes. This means no. Yes! It's a war. Imagine if you're a general in a war. Or a captain. And you send out your soldiers. And they go out on the battlefield. They come back. One of the soldiers goes, They were shooting and stuff at me! They, they threw 
this thing and it blew up and killed a bunch of people? I didn't know that was going to happen. It's war. This is war. There's going to be casualties. There's going to be stuff that happens that you're not really excited about. That's the cost. I'm telling you that up front to get in. He goes on. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so I understood the tower. I understood the war. But then, then he says salt. He's talking to this crowd, and I think what he says is, you all look like salt. What if, you have, what if you've lost that taste? What if you don't have that salty bite? What am I going to do with a bunch of flavorless salt? He says, you're worse than dirt. You know? He says, you're worse than crap. It was like, if you were standing on my pile of crap over there, I'd be like, get off, you're ruining my crap. Now let me ask you a question. Let's just say, let's just say this is real, genuine salt here, okay? It's just a little bit. Just a little bit, but this is real deal salt, okay? And it tastes like salt, and it's good. All right, and let's say in this cup, this is flavorless salt, right? Has no flavor. Can you see any point in me doing this? Can you see any point for that? I do. You know what the point is? Look how big my pile is. How big is your pile? Look how big my pile is. Such a big pile. I like big crowds. I cannot lie. I do. I like to have a full room. I like to have a lot of kids go to camp. I like to have kids here because I feel like if they're here, they get to hear the word. And if they get to hear the word, maybe we can move them from being rocks and thorns to being good soil. So I think there's a value in having people here. But when they're here, I want to give them the truth. I want to be bold. I want to preach Christ to them. And that's not always easy. Because it'd be a lot easier to say, hey, you know what? We got a budget. Let's, let's bring in a bunch of inflatables in here. And let's, let's give pizza every week. And, you know, we'll get kids here. But if I, if I just get them in the door, I haven't done anything with them. I want to get them here. And I want to give them Jesus. And I'm, I'm telling you, when I, when I look at Acts... I just, it scares me. It scares me to death. Some folks will say, you know, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are just really cultural. And so that, you know, that just, that's them. That's not us. And I think, well, I don't really think it's cultural. Otherwise, why did they write about it? I mean, it wasn't normal. What they were doing wasn't normal then either. And it's not normal now. But it's what God called them to. And I feel like it's what he's calling us to as a group. And I hope it's what he's calling you to. We, um, we've been asked to, to meet all, all the ministries in the church have been asked to meet with long-range planning and you know, kind of give our vision and our, our hopes for where we're going as a ministry. And I... Someone told me, you know, that in every church, in every situation, <clears throat> people go to the, the big committees and they ask for two things, right? Better space and more help, right? We need a new youth room because we're outgrowing ours and we need another staff person because we're overtaxed. And, and you know, is that, is that true? Probably. There's probably some truth to that. But it hurt, I mean, hearing that word broke my heart. Because I said, I don't want to go and say, all right, give me what I need. I got my hand out. 
I want to go and say, I want to do what Jesus is calling me to do. And you know what I think Jesus would do? I think Jesus would say, you're outgrowing your room? Let's just meet at the park. Well, what if it rains? Yeah, probably get wet. You ever heard of the Packers? David Stubbs, Green Bay Packers? People will sit in a snowstorm for four and a half hours and pay money to do it. I'm saying, you got 30 minutes? Let's meet at the park, man. Let's go praise Jesus. It's not that much of a sacrifice. Last thing and I'll be done. The one thing I want, the one thing John and I want for this ministry is I want to raise up a crop of students that's a handful of the remnant. I want to raise up that good salt. I want to raise up that good, tasty salt. So that when they graduate high school, like Clay and Townsend, and they go to their college, and they get married, and they move across the country and plant in somewhere other church, I want them to be the leaders at their college, in their dorm, in their classes, in their marriage, in their new church. I want them to be the leaders. And I say new church. A lot of people say, you yeah, know, this is the future of Buncombe Street. Maybe some of them. Stats will tell you about 2% of people will stay planted where they grew up. Everybody else is going away. So that means there's 50 kids over here, one of them. One of them's coming back. That's reality. So if we're sending them out from here, I want them to go where they're going and people to go, where did you, what church did you grow up at? Because you're like crazy. You're nuts. I've never met anybody quite like you. That's, that's my hope. But I'm scared to do some of that. Because some of the things we're talking about doing, starting in the fall, I don't know, man. We may, we may start this thing, everybody may leave. But I'm at peace with the fact that if Jesus is telling me this is what we need to do, and if we obey, he's going to take care of it. And the kids that stay, the kids we have, I'll bank on them. I'll put money on them. I would, I would tell you, if you ever see a kid walk around this church, this youth age, talk to them. I guarantee you'll be impressed. Because the kids that come and they're here, they're solid. We had three students this weekend that are in college that came back to work. Okay? College freshmen coming back here to work for free Free labor to help this weekend happen. That doesn't happen. It doesn't. I was a college freshman not too long ago. If you didn't have money, I wasn't doing nothing for you. <laughs> and we have folks that want to come back and do it for free because they believe in what this is. That's it. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for this morning. Thanks for this ministry that I get to be a part of. Thanks for this church that I get to be a part of. Because I know they believe in us and they support us as a student ministry. I pray that you will, you will bless this church, you will bless this congregation by allowing us to fall in love with you again. Because I need it. There may be folks that don't need it, but I need it. And I want you to continue to pursue me like you do, and I want you to help me to pursue you back. Thank you for these students here this morning. Thanks for their place in our ministry, even if they're not regular attenders here. I'm just, I'm grateful that they're here. Thank you for all that you're doing and all that you're up to. In the name we pray. Amen.